to psychology event. So this is something that we're hoping to do um, yearly or at least regularly. Um, and this is the first time that we're doing it. So, um, you know, hopefully it will go well, but please excuse any, um, you know, baby bumps along the road. Um, so my name is Kylie Hamlin and I'm a professor in the um, Department of Psychology's developmental area. Um, and before I start, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that land we are gathered on today is uh, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam. So we thank the Musqueam Nation for its hospitality and for its support of our work. I'd also like to acknowledge that there are plenty of people joining us on Zoom um, and that the Lower Mainland in general is on the unceded territories of the Squamish, the tsleil and other Coast Salish peoples. Um, and so that plus where our online guests are joining us from, um, we acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands as well. I'd like to mention um, a few other things before I start. To avoid interruptions, if people on Zoom could please um, mute themselves, that would be great. After the talk, we'll be um, taking questions online as well as in the room. Um, if you would like to submit questions online, um, please do so via slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O.com. And the code is hashtag UBC psych. And um, from 2 to 3 p.m., Downstairs on the first and second floors, we're going to be having a research area showcase, a little scavenger hunt, and some snacks and prizes. Um, we have scavenger hunt cards that we can hand you all um, on your way out. And be sure to drop off your completed cards by 3 p.m. on the first floor. Um, and so there are some smaller prizes we're giving away today, and we have a few larger ones that we uh, will be mailing to whoever wins them. Um, there are instructions outside this room and throughout the building. So if you get confused, ask someone in a UBC psych t-shirt or um, check out the signage. Okay, I'm gonna um, introduce Todd Handy who will be introducing our speaker today. Um, and uh, thanks all of you for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks Kylie. Um, it's my pleasure today. Uh, introduce our uh, inaugural homecoming speaker here in psychology. And I think uh, Dr. Julia Cam was an absolutely wonderful choice for this for uh, three central reasons. First, um, Julia was a, uh, an, is an alumnus of our undergraduate honors program. Uh, second, she's actually a PhD alumnus of our program in cognitive psychology. And uh, third and finally, as her title suggests, she does really, really interesting work sort of in the area of uh, dynamic thought and sort of what goes on in our heads as humans having you know, our daily experience of stuff just flowing through our head. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear her talking about this. And so um, she's going to be telling us about work that I guess originally started when she was here at UBC in my lab. Uh, and then she continued on in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Bob Knight down at UC Berkeley. And since uh, 2020 um, has been conducting her own work at the University of Calgary where she's joining us from. So without further ado, please uh, welcome uh, Julia back to UBC. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. So thank you to Kylie and uh, for, uh, for and Todd for the introduction, and thank you to the Department of Psychology for the invitation. Uh, it's really an honor to be here at UBC to speak with you all today. Uh, for those of you who are in the room and those of you who are in the Zoom space um, about uh, some of my research. Um, and so through this talk, I'd like to get you all to start thinking a little bit about our everyday thinking. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay, there we go. Um, so before that, a little bit of background. Um, as Todd has mentioned, um, like may, many of you perhaps, I obtained my undergraduate degree here at UBC and then went on to do a doctoral uh, degree with Todd. Um, and it's really during this time where I developed my interest in scientific research broadly, but also in specifically unraveling the mysteries of the wandering mind. 
After that, I spent a few years at UC Berkeley uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, um, and that's really where I developed a stronger interest in the brain and specifically how the brain supports mind wandering. And for the past few years, um, I had the privilege to start my own lab at the University of Calgary. And along with my uh, students, uh, we've been delving into uh, this sort of um, understanding of mind wandering and how the brain supports this uh, phenomenon. And today, I'm very excited to share with you some of the things that we've learned about mind wandering along the way. So I'm going to start with a couple of questions. Um, so please be comfortable to either just nod or smile or put your hands up. Um, so let's see. Have you had this experience of, you know, driving home, getting there, and then not realizing how you got there? Yeah, right. Um, what about watching a movie or listening to a podcast or attending a talk and then realizing for the past few minutes, you have no idea what just happened? All of us, right? So I think this really exemplifies what we mean by mind wandering. Oh, um, let's see, can we move this? I just realized this is actually blocking a big chunk. Sorry, give me one second here. Oh, I have no idea how to do this. So I'll just let them fix this as we go. Um, essentially, there's a lot of ways that we define mind wandering in the field and in, in, in science, but for the next hour, I like to define it as these moments in time when our attention is focused on our inner thoughts, thoughts that are unrelated to our ongoing task or whatever it is that we're supposed to be doing, and also anything that's unrelated to the external environment. So with that in mind, I'm gonna ask for a third question, which is how often does your mind wander? So for those of you who are in Zoom, kind of think about this as we go, you can just keep your hands up um, for as long as this applies to you. Let's say on average 20% of the day, 40%. Feel free to take a look around you. 60%. I'm going to keep 80%. If your supervisors are here, if your boss is here, feel free to put your hands down. <laughs> totally normal. Hi. Sorry, one sec. Is there any way we can see? Okay, perfect. I'll just let you do your thing. Thank you. Um, so what that tells us is that this is a very common experience. Um, and that also that... Um, No problem, I'll just go back. <laughs> and um, that, but that there are also individual differences, right? So some of us mind wander more regularly than others. Um, but an important point to point out is that we all experience mind wandering. And that's really what I like to talk to you about a bit more today. Um, no, no, you're totally fine. Um, but it would be really nice to be able to maybe remove <laughs> that at some point. Yeah, but I'm just gonna advance maybe as we go and then you can take a look. Thank you. Um, so one of the first questions I wanna talk about is the why. Why do we care about mind wandering? It's something that we write in every single paper, grant application, or even in like in media interviews. And you might even be thinking about this as well, right? So why do we care about mind wandering? And I'll tell you one of the two main reasons for that is something that we've already sort of established in our quick little survey there, right? Which is that it's very, very prevalent. So mind wandering can take up to half of our awake time. That's what scientific studies have shown. And maybe your own personal experience will confirm this. Um, and what's also important to mention is that in addition to being prevalent, the idea is that when it does happen, it can lead to a wide range of impact on our day-to-day -day lives. And more often times than not, we tend to think about the negative outcomes of mind wandering. So for example, when we think about mind wandering, we think about the mistakes that we do. That tends to be very strongly associated with these errors that we make, let's say on an ongoing task, right? You know, this idea of, oh, I you know, wasn't really paying attention, so I knocked over this glass of water, something that happens quite frequently. Another major outcome that's more on the negative end is negative affect. So there's been this really strong association that's been shown in earlier research between mind wandering or not paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing 
and reporting more negative affect. So individuals who report that they weren't paying attention to what they're doing tend to report more negative affect. I'll have a, put a huge caveat to that finding um, and to say that it's really not as simple and straightforward as that. And I'll come back to this in the next slide, telling you a little bit more about how that really just depends on what kind of thoughts that, we, uh, that we're having. And then finally, on the more severe end of the spectrum are clinical symptoms. So when we think about mind wandering, some of the symptoms that you might think about uh, that tends to come to mind are symptoms associated with ADHD or uh, depression. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon as well. So all that to say, um, I think oftentimes we tend to, uh, or at least the earlier research tend to portray mind wandering in relatively negative light. And a lot of us who've studied mind wandering who are studying mind wandering have probably contributed to giving mind wandering a bad name at some point. Um, but I've also come to embrace the experience and realize some of its benefits as well for the past few years. So to redeem myself, I also wanna tell you some of the positive outcomes as well. Uh, one of the ones that are most closely associated with mind wandering is um, the idea that we can come up with some creative solutions to problems. So, if you've, so it's very much like the aha moment, right? So if, you're, if you've ever been stuck on a problem for a really long time, you might come to realize that the solution suddenly comes to you once you step away from it, when you go for a walk or when you're cooking dinner or something like that. And so mind wandering away from your problem has sort of been associated with this ability to come up with uh, creative solutions for it. Now, coming back to this idea of affect or mood, um, some later studies have actually found that if we are thinking about, for example, ourselves in the future, uh, we're more likely to be uh, reporting more positive affect or mood. Or if we are um, engaging in thoughts that jump from one topic to another, so tr truly wandering from topic to topic, that's also more likely to be associated with positive affect. So all that to say, there's not that sort of simple one-to-one -one mapping between mind wandering and affect, but rather really depends on what kind of thoughts we engage in. So finally, um, there's also a very pragmatic output of, of mind wandering, right? We tend to be, um, a lot of us anyway, uh, might be engaging in this sort of planning for a day when we're getting ready in the morning, or you might be thinking about a grocery list as you're driving to the grocery store. Um, so there's this very pragmatic consequence to mind wandering, which is to actually planning um, for the future. So these are just some of the reasons why we care about mind wandering, that it happens very regularly. And when it does happen, it has a huge impact on our day-to-day -day lives, both positive and negative. Okay, I think we might have to just live with the fact that I will be seeing myself on the screen as we go over the slides for the remaining uh, time here. Um, so what that's supposed to say there is, uh, what are the factors that um, uh, impact how often our minds wander? Um, so this, you may be starting to think, well, you know, there are some times when I'm more focused, times when I'm less. Um, so there's definitely individual differences. So differences across individuals, but also differences within yourself. So sometimes you mind wander more, sometimes you mind wander less. First talk about um, individual differences. So differences across individuals. And one of the factors um, that contribute to how often we mind wander is age. So with one of my lab mates, Lindsay Nagamatsu, who's now faculty at Western, um, also in Todd's lab, we looked at uh, mind wandering experiences in older individuals. So in our study, we had individuals between the 66 to 81 years old, and um, we had them do this really boring task. And you're gonna hear me say this quite a bit. Um, so stick them into a dark room, give them a really boring task, and then we ask them to sort of tell us about their attentional states from time to time. And what we found is that um, they reported mind wandering about 30% of the time. And if we take that and then compare that to um, all of our undergraduate students, primarily these younger adults uh, between 18 to 35 years old, um, we, what I'm about to show you is a, an average across 10 studies over um, the span of a few years and uh, probably involving about 200 individuals or so, they tend to report mind wandering about 50% of the time. Same sort of context, right? Boring task, dark room in uh, the psych department. Um, and so, uh, what we're seeing here is, are these sort of numerical differences um, that has been supported by earlier and subsequent studies confirming these findings that there are these age effects. 
So essentially, um, older individuals tend to report lower levels of mind wandering compared to younger adults. That's one factor that um, changes uh, mind wandering frequency. Another one is one that we've already alluded to, so clinical or subclinical symptoms. And the one that's more commonly studied um, is ADHD. So for example, one study found that individuals with ADHD um, reported higher levels of mind wandering compared to individuals without ADHD. Um, and another way of thinking about this is uh, this other study that found that individuals who reported higher levels of mind wandering um, reported also uh, higher levels of ADHD symptoms and specifically the inattentive type. So this is, uh, these are symptoms that are related to distractibility and just not being able to focus on what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and that's the case in when they compare it to individuals who reported lower levels of mind wandering. So what that suggests to us is that regardless of how you look at this relationship, we find the same pattern, which is that there's this positive relationship between individuals with ADHD and those who report mind wandering. So, so far we've talked about individual differences um, and there are also factors that impact how often you as an individual uh, may report mind wandering throughout different times of the day. And that's based on this theoretical framework on current concerns. So the idea being that, you know, we have these priorities and goals. And if what we're supposed to be doing at the moment doesn't really quite align with those priorities, then we might more, we may more likely engage in thoughts align with those goals or concerns that we have currently. So as an example, if you had you know, an argument with your partner or if your family is experiencing some health issues, family member, you're more likely to be probably prioritizing that and thinking about that even though you're supposed to be working, right? Um, an example um, that I've personally experienced during the pandemic was you know, reading a lot about uh, COVID-19 news. So when I read about the news in the morning, I find myself coming back to these news stories throughout the day at work. I don't know if you've had this experience, especially early on during the pandemic. And that's what really inspired the study that we did um, along with my student Chelsea Hart here, where um, we asked individuals to report if they had consumed COVID-19 news, either, you know, if they listened to the radio, I don't know if people still listen to the radio these days, um, or uh, watch the news on TV or through social media. And then we, were, we also asked them to report how focused they are on what they're doing. And what we found was that those who had reported that they've consumed COVID-19 news um, within the past couple of hours, they are more likely to be mind wandering than when they reported not having consumed COVID-19 news, right? So uh, if they've consumed COVID-19 news here, they're more likely to report that they were mind wandering compared to if they were not uh, if they didn't consume COVID-19 news. Um, so now in 2022, we're less likely to be seeing or consuming not news about COVID-19 on a daily basis as we did in 2020, which is when we conducted the study. Um, so we did a second study that replicated these findings and then expanded to just news in general, right? So given this negative bias in news, what we found is that just if you had consumed news in general, you're more likely to be to have to report that you're mind wandering than if you did not consume news. So this is just another factor that can impact our frequency of mind wandering within an individual. And these are just some factors that have been explored. Um, but needless to say, there are a lot of different um, reasons for why we engage in mind wandering more frequently at different times of the day um, and compared to other individuals. So as we're talking about that, that might have prompted you to wonder, well, how do we study mind wandering? You know, something that really only exists in our minds. So the, one of the most commonly used method is experience sampling. Um, and this refers to a method in which we occasionally sample one's inner experience. That's the term experience sampling. And so what we typically do is, again, we get folks to come into our lab, do a really boring task in a dark room, and then occasionally, from time to time, we would ask them to report what they were thinking about. And specifically, were you paying attention to the task that we gave you, or were you not paying attention or mind wandering? And so, oh, works. Okay. So, you know, in the beginning, usually folks are pretty focused. They would report, yes, I was on task. 
And then we ask them again. Oh, it occasionally works um, on task. And then occasionally they might report that they were supposed to say mind wandering over there. So in the course of a task, we might ask them every minute or so just to kind of get a sense of uh, the sort of how their attentional state ebbed and flowed over the course of the task. In the real world setting, we would also do that, but maybe like, for example, the new study that I just told you about every hour or two, we would just send them a text message and say, what are you doing right now? Are you paying attention to what you're doing and how are you feeling and so on. And so this provides us with a really direct report of folks attentional state. But like a critical thinker, you might think, well, this isn't, doesn't this seem a little bit subjective? And you might question, how do we know that they're actually telling the truth and whatnot? And so what we typically do is, com is to combine experience sampling with a, what we call more objective measures, right? So measures that you can't really as easily manipulate or change or lie about. Um, and one of the ones that we typically do in the lab is scalp EEG. Um, so these are just electrodes that are embedded into what looks like a swimming cap that we place on the participant's head in the scalp. And we measure the electrical activity in the brain through this method. Another one that's commonly used is eye movement. So these are eye trackers that track the movements of an individual's eye movement patterns, or we can also track the size of people, uh, the pupil as well. And these are some of the methods um, that get combined with experience sampling to help us get a sense of, you know, where the participant's actual attention state is using different methodology. So in addition to these objective measures, other ways in which we study mind wandering is through machine learning. Uh, so it's a very exciting uh, sort of new direction in which we can try to predict whether someone is actually paying attention to the task or not just by measuring your brain activity or your eye um, movement patterns. We've also talked a little bit about comparing different um, populations, so individuals with and without ADHD or individuals with and without depression and seeing how their mind wandering patterns change. And then to really understand a little bit more about how it works um, in the brain or how the brain supports mind wandering, uh, we've taken on, for example, this lesion approach where we look at individuals with and without a particular brain region intact um, to see how that changes their experience of mind wandering. And then finally, a more invasive approach called intracranial AG is what that says over there, um, where we have electrodes not on the scalp of the individuals, individuals but actually in the brains of, of certain patients. And we'll talk a little bit more about that then later. But these are just some of the common measures of mind wandering that I've used, but there are others that others have used as well, such as fMRI. Um, but we'll primarily talk about um, these three methods in today's talk, and we'll elaborate on them a little bit more as we progress through the talk. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. Just now, were you on task or mind wandering? So if your intention here is to pay attention to the talk, and if you are listening to what I'm saying right now, then your response would be on task. But if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about at this moment, then I would say that it's pretty safe to say that you're probably mind wandering. Um, and so that's an example of experience sampling that we would do in the real world, right? Um, you don't have to tell me your answer, you can just keep that to yourself. Okay, so using these methods to study mind wandering, one of the first uh, things that we asked um, in Talk Lab, uh, the series of questions that we um, asked uh, pertain to the neural consequences of mind wandering. So what's kind of going on in the brain and how does the brain respond to what we're supposed to be doing when we're mind wandering? To address this question, uh, what we did was we, again, had participants come in, do a really boring task. We flashed them with some visual stimuli, shapes, numbers, and whatnot. And then we asked them to respond to some, but not others. Um, and then we record their uh, scalp EEG, uh, they record their EEG through this uh, cap here, this is what this little icon here shows. And then we look at how the brain responds to um, events in the external environment differently when they're paying attention to the task versus to when they're mind wandering. And what I'm about to show you here uh, are the results of our first study. Um, so I'm just gonna walk you through this. We've got time on the x-axis, amplitude on the y-axis that indicates sort of the intensity of the brain's response. Uh, we've got zero here that indicates either, you know, something visual that we're flashing on the screen. In this case, it's a little square. Um, and then what you see here is this, uh, what we call an ERP component. So an event related potential, 
component, which is just a very standard um, measure that we see in particular this P1 here um, in response to a visual stimuli. So when you see a P1 here like this, it means that we are responding to a visual stimuli uh, in the environment. In this case, in this computer screen uh, in front of the participants. So the brain line here indicates the brain's response during uh, an on-task period. And then the green line here indicates the brain's response during mind wandering. And what you immediately see is that when we're mind wandering, we see the smaller uh, P1 ERP response compared to when we are on task. So essentially, during mind wandering, our brain's response to visual stimuli in the external environment is reduced. The way I tend to think about this is, you know, if you were working in a coffee shop or in your, you become absorbed in your own thoughts, that conversation uh, at the table next to you, it starts to fade into the background, yeah? I see that as sort of like a behavioral manifestation of this uh, reduction in our brain's response uh, to external stimuli during mind wandering. So that was the first study that we did where we found that mind wandering disrupted our visual response. And since then, we've replicated this study time and again um, and looking at different types of cognitive functions that were also disrupted. So for example, uh, we did another study where we flashed uh, in images that and sort of elicited certain emotions. Um, and we see this P3 as a response to those images um, that are a bit more emotional or elicit uh, certain emotional states. And once again, we see that when we are mind wandering as indicated by this green line here, uh, there's, that there's this reduction in the response to an ERP component um, compared to when we're actually paying attention to those images. And then again, we found this during this um, process called uh, performance monitoring as indicated by um, an ERP component that we can't see here, but essentially it tracks our ability to monitor our performance, right? So if you are, for example, playing video games and you're trying to um, uh, uh, you know, shoot a, a bad person in, in the game, um, being able to adjust if you had missed that shot uh, subsequently is what allows you to perform better over time. And this measure here that you cannot see um, on the screen uh, is, is what we see is that there's a great uh, a much larger a ERP component when we're paying attention to the task compared to when we're mind wandering. So this kind of goes back to, you know, that impaired task performance that we talked about earlier on when we mind wander, we tend to make errors. And what this seems to suggest is that not only do we make errors, but we also don't adjust our performance subsequently to perform better. So all of these studies and many more um, really kind of converge on this notion that mind wandering seems to lead to this widespread disruption of our brain's response to external uh, stimuli. Um, but then what we actually realize is that it doesn't always lead to a disruption or a reduction in our brain's response. There are also times when it actually leads to an increase in our brain's response um, during mind wandering. So I'm gonna uh, show you now these findings um, that was led by a study or that, uh, that Sean uh, really took the lead in executing when I was in Berkeley. Um, what I'm seeing here, what we're seeing here is uh, what we call time frequency activity. That is uh, also um, data that we get from EEG. And what we have here is time on the X axis and frequency on the Y axis. So these are brain rhythms that we pick up from EEG data. Um, the numbers on the lower end, so if we're looking at two to three hertz, uh, that means that there are two to three rhythms or ebbs and flows and cycles within a second. So these are the really slow wave activity that we tend to associate with, for example, sleep. And then there are also quicker rhythms, uh, faster rhythms that are um, ebbing and flowing about 50 times per second. What I'd like to bring your attention to is this blob of yellow here, which indicates uh, more activity compared to the blue, which means less activity. And this tends to hover around the 10 Hertz range. So about 10 cycles per second. This is what we called alpha activity. And what we're seeing here is that there's a really large amount of alpha activity that we see during um, the reports of mind wandering. Now, if you compare that to on task periods, we see that this magnitude of that alpha activity is significantly greater than when we're uh, actually on task or paying attention to an external task. Um, 
So because we see greater alpha activity when we're reporting mind wandering, um, it's been now considered as a fairly reliable marker of mind wandering. And we've uh, found that this to be the case across many other studies in a recent review that we did. So all of that kind of tends to converge to this idea that alpha activity, especially in the back of the brain, seems to be a marker for mind wandering. So when we see alpha activity in back, that's also when we tend to be mind wandering. So far, I've told you a little bit about what we expect to see in response to some external stimuli um, when we're mind wandering. So how we respond to the external environment, but it doesn't quite get at you know, how the brain actually supports mind wandering. And that's really a, a question that I focused on when I was um, at Berkeley. And one of the first things that we looked at was this particular brain region that seems to be important for attention broadly. Um, so this region called the lateral prefrontal cortex. So um, in the frontal part of the frontal cortex and on the lateral side. And so this part of the brain has been shown to be very important for attention broadly, whether we are attending externally to the environment or internally to our own thoughts, it's been shown to be very important. And also, um, it's also been shown to connect with different brain areas to represent information um, that are relevant to our current goals. So if my current goal right now is to engage with you, then the lateral prefrontal cortex would, will connect with brain areas that are important for um, presenting information externally. But if my current goal is to you know, think about some, some things that matter to me, then the lateral prefrontal cortex would connect with brain regions that are responsible for that. So it's very flexible in what information it can process. And what I was interested in was whether the lateral prefrontal cortex is necessary for mind wandering. And that's what uh, this little icon here indicates. Um, oh, sorry, Hang on. lost my, okay. And was that we, we actually collected data from patients with lesions in that brain area in the lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, what you see here, each of these blue lines reflect or in each of these slices of the brain on the left here. So we go from top to bottom and these colored blobs here indicate the location of the lesions of the patient. So the lighter the color, the greater the overlap across patients. So what you can see and gather from this is that the majority of our patients have lesions on the left side of the brain in the lateral, in the prefrontal cortex area. So in addition to uh, recruiting patients with lesions in that brain area, we also recruited patients with intact brains as a control. And the logic goes as this. So if these patients with lesions in the lateral prefrontal cortex show a similar response as our controls, then we can probably claim that the lateral prefrontal cortex is not necessary for that function, right? Because with and without that brain area, you can perform the same functions. However, if patients perform worse than the controls or their brain responses are different, then we would suggest that the lateral prefrontal cortex is necessary for that function because without it, you can't really perform the same way um, that controls can, right? Okay, so what we have these, both groups of participants do was yet again, a really boring task. Um, and so in this task, we presented them with these tones. Most of the times they uh, occur in this sort of similar pitch, so a lower pitch, but occasionally we'll present them in a higher pitch. Half of the time in the external condition, we ask them to pay attention to the tones and press a button whenever they hear the higher pitch tone, what we call the target tone. Pretty simple, simple task, right? Um, and then half the time in the internal condition, we actually ask them to ignore all the tones and just think about whatever comes to your mind. So really mind wandering from the perspective of just not paying attention to the external environment. And what studies have found is that during this external condition, when we're paying attention to the tones and detecting these target tones, um, we see this increase in theta activity. So remember those brain rhythms that I told you about, theta activity tends to ebb and flow at about four to seven cycles per second. So it's a slower wave. Um, and during these external, uh, during the external condition, because studies have found that they tend to show theta activity, we predicted that there would be uh, more theta activity in the external condition. 
In contrast, um, during the internal condition, as we've talked about earlier, we see this alpha um, activity as a marker for mind wandering. Because we've seen this in past studies, we predicted that we would see increased alpha during the internal condition when folks were just told to think about whatever comes to mind, ignore what's going on in the, in, in your, in the environment around you. So a summary, we thought that theta activity would be a proxy for the external condition when participants were told to just you know, uh, respond to the tones um, and detect the target tone, whereas alpha activity would serve as the proxy for the internal condition when folks were encouraged to mind wander. And here's what we found. So let's first look at theta activity, so the slower rhythms. And what we see here are the, um, uh, uh, the data for the controls. So these are individuals without a brain lesion. And what you see is that for the external condition, we see this increase in theta activity to the tones, and then a much smaller response uh, to the tones during the internal condition when they were told to just ignore them. Right, so this is what we had predicted that there would be greater theta activity during the external condition. Now compare that to the controls. So these are, sorry, compare that to the patients with lesions in the lateral prefrontal cortex. We see that their response is pretty much overlapped so that there's really no, um, uh, there's really no difference between the two conditions um, in the patients with lesions in the lateral prefrontal cortex. So what we can conclude from that, as you can see, is that lesions in the lateral prefrontal cortex leads to a disruption in our ability to attend to external stimuli. So that's been found in the past. Um, what we're really interested in is this next set of findings, focusing on alpha activity. So what we see here is that in the controls, we see that uh, in the internal condition that there's greater alpha activity uh, compared to the external condition. So it's essentially the opposite results as the uh, previous set of findings, and also one that we had predicted because of um, previous findings showing that alpha activity is really uh, important for mind wandering. And once again, compare that to patients with lesions in the brain, we see that there's this overlap in their response uh, between the two conditions. Results are less clear cut than the previous set of findings, but nonetheless suggest that lesions in the lateral prefrontal cortex leads to a disruption in um, our ability to engage in these inner thoughts. So if we take both sets of findings together, um, this really seems to suggest that the lateral prefrontal cortex, so this part of the brain here, is necessary for supporting mind wandering as well as external attention, but we're really only interested in mind wandering here. So it's a very good step, first step to understanding which part of the brain is important for mind wandering. But one of the uh, main um, limitation to studying lesion patients is that um, we don't really actually know what's going on in the brain that is necessary for mind wandering, right? Because that part of the brain is not present. Um, and so we needed to turn to a methodology um, that allows us to uh, test this question out in pay, uh, participants with intact brains. The other limitation is that you know, we focus on this one brain region, but what we know is that when we're engaging in complex cognitive functions, it engages many parts of the brain. Um, and so we wanted to expand beyond just one part of the brain uh, in the subsequent study. And so for ad addressing both of those limitations, we turned to a method called intracranial EEG. So we started by talking about um, scalp EEG. These are electrodes that are placed on our scalp. Intracranial EEG is a method that involves um, placing or implanting electrodes inside participants', participants brains, which is sort of indicated by this little icon there. Um, and these uh, are electrodes that are implanted um, in epilepsy patients, generally speaking, based on clinical reasons. So essentially, in order to determine where the epileptic seizures are coming from, neurologists would then determine based on um, the electrical activity that they see in the electrodes um, that are embedded into their brains to determine the source of the epileptic seizures. And then once they determine the source, they would resect that part of the brain. So this is all based on clinical um, reasons. Um, and as scientists, we would just... Uh, essentially invite the, part, uh, the patients when they have these electrodes implanted in their brains while they're at the hospital to see if they're interested in participating in, their study, in our study um, and, and contributing to science. 
And these are examples of electrodes that get implanted into really the cortical surface of the brain. So if, we, if you imagine this here being the brain, we strip the scalp, the skull, um, and everything else uh, until we get to the brain. And these are electrodes that actually get placed onto the surface of the brain. Or there are these other types of electrodes that gets um, essentially drilled into the brain so that we can target the more medial structures of the brain. So with patients uh, with these electrodes implanted into their brains, we wanted to look at how activity in different parts of the brain uh, are engaged uh, during mind wandering. And we focused on two particular types of networks. So these are just uh, regions of the brain that are maybe far apart from each other, but work together to help us do what we do. And one of these networks is the default mode network. So this is a network of regions that are really widely distributed. So front to back, lateral, so on the side, and also medial as well. And it's very strongly associated with mind wandering, uh, traditionally anyway. Um, and a lot of other sort of internally oriented uh, cognitive functions. So for example, if you're thinking about the past um, and yourself in the past, that tends to uh, recruit the default mode network. If you're thinking about others in a social situation, that also tends to recruit the default mode network. So that's one network that we're interested in. Another one is the frontal parietal control network. Um, and a core part of, the, of this network is the lateral prefrontal cortex that we just talked about. Uh, and so along with the lateral prefrontal cortex in other regions, uh, this is a control network uh, that has been implicated in, as the name suggests, high level control processes. So if you're trying to focus on a task that tends to recruit, for example, the, uh, this network here. And in a recent paper that came out of actually Kalina and Christoph's lab here, um, the Department of Psychology, um, they found that there are actually sub networks in the frontal parietal control network. So there are some regions that are primarily responsible for controlling things that we do that involve the external environment. And then there are also some a sub network of regions that are responsible for um, these functions that we do that are con that involve controlling internally oriented functions. So for short, I'm going to call them the external control network and the internal control network. And what they found was that there is a much stronger relationship between the default mode network and the internal control network, but not the external control network. So this really sets the stage very nicely for our study, um, because what they found with fMRI is that when these areas in the default mode network become active, so does the areas in the internal control network. But what we don't quite know is how these networks tend to work together. And so using intracranial EEG, we can look at how they work together through these um, brain rhythms that we've just talked about. We specifically focused on the theta band rhythm. So these slow rhythms that we've talked about previously, because it's been very strongly implicated in control processes. So whenever we're trying to direct our attention to something, uh, theta band activity tends to be engaged. So we had patients um, with these electrodes implanted in their brains in these particular regions. So we looked at all three networks. We're mostly only interested in these two, but we also tested this one as co for comparison purposes. And then we had participants do again, this really boring task where they sometimes were told to pay attention to the tones, respond to the tones, and other times you just ignore all the tones um, completely. And what we're seeing here are electrodes implanted across all of our patients in these networks, right? So the red electrodes are electrodes in the default mode network, this is front of the brain, in the back. Um, so a lot of electrodes really all over the front, back, lateral, and medial. And then also electrodes that are implanted in the external control network in the dark blue and internal control network in the light blue. So again, we looked at the theta band connectivity between the default mode network and the internal control network. That's our primary question. And then also uh, looked at the external control network for comparison purposes. And here's what we found. So let's first look at the one that we're really interested in, which is the default mode network and the internal control network. Um, what we see here are the correlation values. So to what extent do um, theta band activity, these low rhythms, um, correlate between these two networks? Uh, what we see here is the internal condition on the right and external condition on the left. And what we found is that the 
data band connectivity between the default mode network and the internal control network is significantly stronger uh, during the internal condition when they were told to just mind wander essentially compared to when they were told to pay attention to the tones of the external condition. So this is really nice because it replicates previous findings, but also tell us a little bit more about how these two areas tend to work together, which is through communicating in sort of a similar wavelength, as if you will. But that, trust me on this, this is what we're showing here on this side here that's blocked out a little bit, that we don't really see this pattern at all between the default mode network and the external control network that we tested for comparison purposes. So, Summarize, we found that connectivity in the theta band, so these low rhythms that we see in the brain uh, between the default mode network and the internal control network seems to be at least one mechanism that allows our brain to support uh, our mind wandering experience. This is one of, um, I guess, the first studies um, that really uh, reveal uh, some sort of mechanisms uh, in the brain that, that suggests how we might actually engage in mind wandering and many, many more um, hopefully will come in the field. So in summary, we've talked a little bit about how mind wandering is prevalent and impacts our daily life. We've also talked about um, some of the different factors that uh, uh, impact how often we engage in mind wandering, such as age, clinical symptoms, and uh, our, you know, if we had some sort of current concerns that are really um, our priority at the moment. We've talked about how we can use both subjective and objective measures to understand how the brain responds to the uh, environment when we're mind wandering, which for the most part is sort of a widespread disruption uh, of, of a response to the external environment when we're mind wandering, and also how different regions and connections between them uh, seems to support mind wandering. So in addition to continuing on to study how the brain supports mind wandering um, in, in my lab at the moment, uh, we also took on a few uh, sort of directions currently and also will likely continue in the future. One of which is using machine learning algorithms to predict our, uh, our state of mind, one of which is mind wandering. So for example, uh, Henry here uh, really took the lead on a project where we try to predict whether someone is on task or mind wandering using EEG recently. Um, and we were able to do it above chance level, not to a great extent. So that's something that we're hoping to work on in the future. Um, but what that means is that we can eventually imagine the implications of these findings, right? If you can predict whether someone is paying attention to their task or not, that has huge implications for uh, the educational context. Um, for example, also when we're driving, um, it'd be good to be able to focus on the road uh, most of the times as opposed to not knowing you know, how we got home, for example. Uh, also implications for air traffic controllers who spend most of their day staring at you know, flights coming in and out and where mind wandering in those situations may lead to very grave consequences as well as customs inspection officers who seems to spend you know, most of their time just staring at an X-ray of luggage um, content. In addition to that, uh, another um, direction that we're taking um, is to really try to understand clinical populations through their thought patterns. So for example, we've talked a little bit about, about ADHD individuals uh, with and without ADHD tend to have different types of thought patterns. Um, we've also, we also know that individuals with and without depression also show differences in thought patterns as well. So understanding how we engage in you know, our thoughts and the type of thoughts that we have and may help us understand better um, these differences between populations. And so these are um, all projects that we're very excited to, to pursue and hopefully we'll be able to tell you a little bit more in the next few years. So to wrap up, um, I just want to say that in preparation for this talk, it really has me, you know, reflecting upon my journey. And, and, uh, and there's been a lot of people along the way that have supported me and uh, also um, have really, really amazing collaborators that I'm very excited about, uh, excited to work with. Uh, but there's a few individuals I want to point out, one of which is Todd here, uh, who really provided a very welcoming and supportive space for us to pursue what we're really passionate about. And, and taking that to Berkeley, uh, working with Bob um, as my postdoc supervisor, who's also provided immense support um, that allowed me to 
eventually, uh, you know, get to the University of Calgary to start my own lab. And with my students, now I get to um, tackle, you know, scientific questions on the, with them on a day day-to-day basis, um, which uh, is really, uh, has been a really fun and rewarding experience for the most part, um, as amidst the pandemic is, is what I meant. Um, and then finally, um, I want to thank you all for being here today on this beautiful sunny afternoon in Vancouver. So thank you for your attention. My understanding is that um, I will take some questions now if you have any, uh, either from the audience in the space or in Zoom. Yeah. I've been wondering, uh, this, uh, this mind, is that the same as distraction? Yeah. Like, that's yeah. Um, but uh, there's, there's other possibility of distraction, for instance. Uh, when something comes up, uh, like there could be something, you get distracted through something else. That's not one thought replacing the other. Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, this idea of distraction versus mind wandering. Um, I, so I think in the way that we study mind wandering, we don't tend to focus as much on external distraction. We tend to think about the thoughts that we have internally. Um, but in certain definitions of mind wandering, uh, that would very much include a distraction as well, right? So if all I'm saying is, um, as long as you're not paying attention to the task, so let, let's say listening to me talk right now is your task, and then suddenly you hear a boom somewhere else, like that, perfect. Um, I did not plan that. Um, and your attention immediately goes to where that is, then that would also be some sort of, that would sort of be considered as, you know, mind wandering if the definition is just strictly related to the task in and of itself. Um, so I hate to say this, but you know, it really depends on how we define it. And in, in, in science, we have various definitions of mind wandering that we're working with at the moment um, and lots of debates about how we go about defining mind wandering. So I think you know, my response would be, it depends on how we define it, but certainly there are overlaps with distractibility. Yeah, yeah. I have a question from Zoom. Thank you. Do you know of any case where mind wandering was really high to the point that it could be detrimental to the person? Oh, interesting. Um, I can speak to the first part of the question first. Um, so actually, when I was in Todd's lab, we came across these studies that looked at what they called compulsive fantasizers. I don't know if you remember. So these are individuals who commit to mind wandering as, as almost like a social event. So instead of going out with friends, they would just rather prioritize being at home and wandering and you know, creating their own sort of internal world, really. Um, so I think it can happen very excessively, but these are also individuals with you know, um, professional jobs and, and whatnot. So I don't think it's detrimental to their profession per se, um, but certainly, um, excessive amounts, I guess, compared to normatively how we how often we engage in mind wandering. Um, I think it becomes detrimental when you are engaging in something else that could lead to grave consequences, right? So some of the things that we've talked about previously in the implications uh, is if you were a customs inspection officer or air traffic controller and you mind wander away from your job, that could lead to very grave consequences. So it really depends on, I think, the context in which our mind wandering occurs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think there's some mic. Would you mind waiting for that? Um, so I'm interested if you know of any like effective strategies that people might use to self-regulate their mind wandering yeah. and whether these might change between children and adults. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that's something that we all kind of want to do at some point, right? Um, so I can... I can give you, um, I can answer in terms of strategies. I don't know if they're effective or at least effective consistently across individuals. So I think one strategy that a lot of people have started to look at is mindfulness training, right? Um, so it kind of goes back to what I was referring to earlier, where it's more about whether you can control when it happens as opposed to controlling it so that it doesn't happen at all. And as I mentioned, you know, there are these positive outcomes to mind wandering. So I wouldn't actually really encourage people to get rid of mind wandering altogether, but you do want to be able to know or control when it happens, right? So if you have a deadline, 
you probably don't want to be mind wandering very far away from your work that leads to that deadline. Um, but um, but yeah, I think mindfulness training is a very common one um, that works for some individuals and not. I think there's a lot of mixed research out there at, at this point. Um, and what is another one? Let me think. Mindfulness. That's the first thing that comes to mind right now. But there are lots of experts out there. So if you have any suggestions, um, please, please share as well. But I think that would be the main one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh. I noticed that when you were comparing the, I noticed that when we were comparing or you were comparing the um, external line to the internal mind wandering mm -hmm. line and the amplitude wasn't as great. Um, I thought, however, it was still nevertheless interesting that the line tra tracked in parallel in many cases, which meant that the internal functionality was still taking place with attention. Yeah. And I thought, well, why is that happening at all? If you're really mind wandering effectively, like in a contemplative state of mind, you shouldn't right. even notice that external stimuli at all. Right, right. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that, you know, we did notice was, was that is that it's not that it's completely absent, right? So if we go back to those questions about, you know, what, how, to what extent our brain responds to information in the external world. Um, and I would say that it's sort of similar to this idea that the voice in the coffee shop fades away, but it's still there, right? Because, you know, our hearing functions have not been disrupted or our visual functions have not been completely disrupted. It's not like we actually, you know, closed our eyes so we can still more or less see or hear, but it just fades into the background is uh, how we would think about the experience of mind wandering and how that changes our interactions with the external environment. Does that help address the question? I don't have a answer to the why, but I can I can speculate as to why the, you know uh, you know why it is that we see this pattern, per se. Mm -hmm. um, have you? I it's slight not exactly what you're saying, but is there any any correlation between creativity and mind water yeah. wandering? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm excited because I think that's one of the main benefits that we tend to highlight uh, over and over again. So um, one of those positive outcomes that I mentioned, the creative problem solving. So that's really a, 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 a sort of similar to creativity, essentially. Um, so the studies that have found this is, is similar to what the example that I gave, which was we tend to, you know, when we get stuck in a problem, especially when we get stuck in a problem, um, we sometimes come across these uh, aha moments when we take our minds off of it, uh, off of the problem, I mean. And so there's this idea that, you know, when we're um, not really laser focused onto solving the problem, that's when our, these solutions come to mind. Um, and going for a walk is some example, sometimes an example that I would give. And that's very much uh, related to these other set of findings that found that actually just taking a walk in nature enhances creativity in general. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, overlap between, you know, the benefits of just letting your mind go once in a while and also being in nature maybe helps facilitate that. Yeah. Um, I've been informed we are on a time deadline. Oh, sure. Um, so I wanna say thank you so much for sharing all your work and it's been absolutely wonderful to see what you've been up to since you left UBC and I have a much better understanding what was happening in Berkeley and now in Calgary. And so that was great. So thank you so much. And uh, another round of applause. And thank you so much for coming.